Ren needed to hide an entire building. Like any large construction project, St. Paul's needed a vast framework of scaffolding. Wren could hide his architectural rebellion behind a screen of timber and canvas. But there was another problem. He was worried that the money might run out before he could complete his masterpiece. After the destruction of the Great Fire, Rebuilding both the city and its magnificent new cathedral was a massive financial burden. Most of the money would be raised through a tax on the main domestic fuel, coal. The Royal Commission wanted the cathedral, but the coal tax was set by Parliament, so it held the purse strings. Wren feared Parliament wouldn't stomach the cathedral's costs, and might halt construction before it was complete. Building the cathedral in sections, Wren knew the money could run out before he realized his dream of crowning it with a glorious dome. He gambled with a bold and simple plan and committed to building the whole cathedral. Long before he'd completed other sections of the building, Wren had already laid the foundations for his visionary dome. He calculated that Parliament wouldn't call a halt to the half-built cathedral, leaving an eyesore in the heart of the city. They would have to complete the cathedral as he planned. But behind the timber curtain, Wren quickly ran into engineering problems. Rejecting the Gothic style in favor of his classical vision created a structural challenge. To prevent them from collapse, high-walled buildings need extra support. In Gothic buildings, this job is done by the flying buttress. Freestanding buttresses allow thin walls to rise to extraordinary heights. Flying buttresses presented a particular problem for Wren because they were, in essence, Gothic. And if he was to design a cathedral where they could be seen on the outside, the building would not look classical. And thus, he had to devise a way of hiding them. Wren had an ingenious plan to save his classical vision. Where the old cathedral had thin walls supported by buttresses, Wren built massive walls, two and a half times thicker. But Wren was aware these colossal walls could destroy the building's elegance. So to make his walls appear lighter, Wren devised a clever disguise. The walls are massive, over 16 and a half feet thick. Now normally if you make walls that thick, the internal space is going to be very dark. But Wren's great move is to carve out this great niche. So the windows are set on the outside wall and the space is flooded with light. Well, the masonry on either side acts as great internal buttresses, strengthening the wall. Despite these reinforcements, Wren still needed additional support for the upper stories. He had a brilliant solution. An aisle was to run along each side of the building. Wren's idea was to put buttresses inside the lean-to roof over this aisle. They would be invisible. But it wasn't enough. Wren soon calculated that his hidden buttresses wouldn't be up to the job. The load on the walls meant they would need to be supported much higher up, so the buttresses needed to be steeper and more visible. It was a disaster. The engineering would be on show, just as it was in old Gothic cathedrals, precisely what Wren was determined to avoid. Another quick fix needed to be found. 
Wren devised an original design to hide the problem. With a fake wall. Under the dome and at the west end, the cathedral is two stories high. Wren decided to make it look as if the rest of the cathedral would also be two stories high by using false screen walls all the way round. This is what those screen walls look like from the inside, creating this enormous space which conceals these flying buttresses, these features that are essential for holding up the upper half of the cathedral. This enabled the inside of the cathedral to be built without any ornament, cheaper and easier. But despite Wren's skill, lower down the project hit an embarrassing setback. To save money on laborious stone cutting, Wren built the cellar vaults out of bricks. The builders constructed the vaults over a wooden frame. Once the brick vault was complete, they backfilled the space above with rubble and removed the frame. When the wooden formers were taken away, it was a disaster. The vaults collapsed. We're not exactly sure what happened, but we think it was a problem with not adequately backfilling behind the vault. If we imagine this is a model of the vault, the floor of the cathedral would come here. Now, the backfill was rubble that was poured in to this triangle left over. Now, with the weight of the floor on top pushing down, it tends to push up these elements of the arch. Without the backfill, they would lift, causing the arch to collapse. Even more embarrassingly for Wren, the vaults collapsed not just once, but twice. Wren couldn't afford delays. Parliament demanded results. The 58-year-old architect needed Parliament to renew the coal tax to keep the money flowing. He had to finish the East End, the choir, so ministers could hold services again. But once that was complete, there was a chance that the Royal Commission would call a halt to the rest of the building, which would leave Christopher Wren with little chance of living to see his dome completed. One of the crown jewels of St. Paul's Cathedral is the choir. Elegant and ornate, it is a showpiece of 17th century craftsmanship and a fitting interior for the great cathedral. In the late 1690s, Christopher Wren, now in his 60s, feared that this was all he would ever see of his classical cathedral. The money was running out. In its time, St. Paul's Cathedral was the most expensive building in England. Its total cost was more than £804,000, around a billion pounds in today's money. 20 years into construction, a tax on coal still provided the finance. But Parliament held the purse strings. Before his paymasters would vote for more money for the project, Wren would have to complete the east end of the cathedral, the choir, so they could hold services again. But this presented a dilemma. Wren had been working on the entire building at the same time to ensure that his cathedral was crowned with a magnificent dome. Now, even when the money was short and he needed to concentrate on the choir, Wren still continued with his gamble. He refused to slow down work on other parts of the cathedral. Wren's dilemma is that if he finishes the choir, they might lose interest in the rest of the building, even while he's working on the, on the choir, he is um, issuing contracts and commissions to masons to begin work on the great piers that are going to support the dome. So he's hoping that if, if work is underway on all parts of the building, it will be harder 
for Parliament and the Commission and the clergy to lose interest in the building once they've got their choir. At the same time, Wren couldn't save money by cutting corners on the choir. It had to be an architectural triumph that would win over his critics and keep the cash flowing. The work continued at a furious pace. Wren used several teams of masons to increase competition and speed up the work. But he had to feed them a continuous supply of building stone that needed to be transported from 300 kilometers away in Portland on the south coast. Most of the stone from Portland came round by sea. It was so much easier because the roads were so poor. This contorted route caused delays. Many ships were held up by storms or even captured by the French Navy. No architect wants their workmen to be standing idle on a, on a building site because the materials haven't arrived. You've got to keep the flow of materials arriving so that they're in the right place at the right time for the project to move forward. Wren was discovering the art of project management. He faced similar problems with the roof timbers. Vertical king posts were to hold up the horizontal tie beams that would span the roof. But Wren's building was to be so wide that his tie beams would need to be massive. Wren chose a king post roof structure, which gave him the low profile on the outside and a long span so that you could barely see the roof from outside the cathedral. And it relied on these tie beams. You could make this out of two pieces of wood and join them together in the middle. But as in everything at St. Paul's, he didn't want to cut corners. He wanted to make something simple that would last a long time. Wren wanted timber that could span 14 meters. But he didn't just need one, he needed 48. And to make them, he needed 150-year-old oak trees. A duke offered oaks from his estate, but they were 250 kilometers away. Transporting them by cart over rutted tracks and then by ship took weeks. When the timbers finally arrived, Wren completed the roof. The east end was nearly finished, but was still open to the elements where it would join the planned dome. Wren asked his carpenters to craft a huge wooden wall to keep out the rain. Only when the choir was weatherproofed could Wren call on master craftsmen from all across Europe to decorate the interior. In 1694, Wren could finally turn his focus onto the decoration of the choir. He wanted only the best craftsmen, and for his carving he went to Grinling Gibbons by far the most extraordinary carver of his generation. Right at the beginning of the process, they sat down and decided that because they were not able to do the Catholic tradition of saints and of New Testament um, characters, they would reach for nature. They would go for a, a, the abundant harvest of the natural world. And they devised a series of beautiful panels, which include cornucopia, bursting pea pods, of heads of corn in order to represent the beauty of the natural world. They also came up with a series of cherubs to run along both sides of the stalls. The story goes that Grinling Gibbons based um, all of the cherubs on, on the faces of his two twin children. But in fact, uh, every single one is unique and an extraordinary testament to England's premier carver, perhaps the greatest carver in British history. In December 1697, the choir was finally finished, 31 years after the old cathedral burnt down. The east end of St. Paul's was ready, just in time to become a renewed focus of national pride. The war against France was over, and the people of London came out to celebrate. It would have been a, a very important occasion at Ludgate Hill was thronged with people and carriages 
uh, eager to take part in the service and to see their new cathedral, part of their new cathedral.